Thanks for joining me. I'm excited to be here and talk to you about Primetime Profi, what every hygienist should know about the business of dentistry. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Paul Goodman. Uh, I have a website, dentalnachos.com, a large Facebook group, Dental Nachos. I'll tell you a little bit about myself as we go along here. Uh, this webinar is for you guys and for you to get questions answered, things you're thinking about if you're a hygienist, office manager, dentist, and how the role of hygienist and hygiene is changing in general practices um, pretty much every day and has been over the past couple of years. Some of these changes uh, seem new, but they've been in place for a while or there's been signs of this happening for a while. So you can submit your questions, Evan, and we'll all answer that in the second half of the webinar. So I like to start off talking about you know, what's the life of a dentist like? What's the life of a dental team member versus Daphne? Daphne is currently uh, three and a half, almost four years old. But when she was a baby or almost one year, one year old, this was uh, part of her life was like this. When she would see uh, her parents' dogs, she would be happy, excited. It's a little bit like being a dentist or a dental team member when things go well. Patients are showing up on time. Uh, people are paying. Lab cases are there. The team members are getting along. Everyone's uh, being nice to each other. But one of the hard parts about working in a dental office uh, is that it can change in just an instant and turn into this. So my sister, who is the parent of three children, said, you know, children are very emotionally labile. And I think the dental offices are the same way. So I you know, understand if you are working in a dental office every day, whether it's just three, three human beings or 30 human beings, I know it's not easy because I'm doing it too. And everybody's in close quarters. Uh, a lot of the patients, most of them really don't want to be there. So how can we make our life easier? How can we hopefully do things to make ourselves happier each day, or at least what I kind of say in the dental office, less annoyed. So when people ask me if I'm happy or what does it mean to be happy? Not an easy question to answer, but what's it take to be less annoyed? That's uh, um, an easy thing, thing for us to accomplish. So let's talk about some things here that'll help us with that. So this is our dental office in Pennington. That's my brother, Jeff Goodman. Uh, it's a family practice has been in place for over 60 years. We have uh, multiple general dentists, a periodontist, a dentist who does sleep apnea. We don't have the picture here, but we also have a satellite office in Ewing, New Jersey. So we are the proud parents of uh, two, two dental offices. And we have my second child, the sequel child coming up here in uh, less than a month. So uh, having your second dental office is, I don't know if it's like having your second child. If it is, I'm going to want to return my child in a, uh, in a year. No, I'm, I'm just joking, but it is fun to be the practice parent of two practices, but it's a lot of moving parts and pieces. So why do I do these things? You know, as a practicing dentist, why do I teach? Do transitions broken? I'll tell you about that. And my why is that we all need help, and me included, because uh, dentisting is not easy and being in dental office is not easy. So this was Daphne when she was about two and a half years old. I don't know what she's doing. She thinks it's a good idea. So I guess to try to climb over the security desk going that way and got herself stuck. So I'd help her down. So I like to do the same thing for dentists, dental team members, office managers, hygienists, create a positive impact for you, decrease dentist and dental office stress because we're all dealing with different stresses each day and be a nacho friend. But what that means to me is like everybody loves nachos. You're always happy to see them. I want people to feel the same way about me, whether I'm coming into your office as a friend, a patient, a consultant, a coach, another dentist, um, transitions broker, someone you can count on to hope to be there to help you, give you good responsible information. Uh, doesn't mean to go easy on you. A lot of times, you know, when you're getting uh, consulted or coached, you have to hear some tough things about your practice. That happens to me. We've had consultants and coaches. I think one of the things that's important, uh, whether it's with being a dentist, trying to get in good shape, being better, at, you know, becoming a better golfer, is that it's hard to look outside yourself and identify what's going wrong. So sometimes you need to bring someone in to give you some feedback who's objective. So I do do a lot of things. Dental nachos is based on me and all the jobs that I do and all the roles that I play. I always feel like nachos are a mixture of a lot of different things where they come together. Uh, they're a lot of fun. I hope I feel uh, people feel the same way about me. So I practice as a general dentist with my brother uh, I had mentioned there before and associates. Transitions broker selling, selling practices with United Dental Brokers of America teaching dental implant courses with different companies, but a lot hyacin. One of the things that you could recommend to your dentist, or you may want to um, listen to on the way to work or at the gym or just hanging out at your house is our podcast, the dental amigos. What we do talk about is the business of dentistry, all the things they didn't teach you in dental school, but they should have, whether it's transitions, whether it's hiring an associate, whether it's working as part of a team. So we've put a lot of great content out there. We have a lot of good guests. 
We've got Jamie Amos. I know some of you guys know him from Ideal Practices, but they do a lot of startups. So just a lot of cool content. There's a lot of great, great podcasts out there to listen to. I do consulting and teach at uh, Albert Einstein and Temple, the Dental Nachos Facebook group. So if you're not part of the group, feel free to join. Uh, Ariel, who is my uh, awesome coordinator, will approve you. And in that group, I've tried to create a dentist playground. Uh, one of the things, I mean, hygienists have their own group. Dentists have their own group. Office managers have their own group. But for me, um, for me, let me just get this back here. For me, uh, I wanted a group that had everybody. So it has dentists, dental hygienists, dental assistants, reps, um, accountants, attorneys. So for me, it's, the, it's, you know, I would just saw the Mr. Rogers movie, which was great. And uh, kind of the people you meet in your neighborhood. I want it to be the people that you're going to meet in your dental office neighborhood. So I intentionally have everybody connecting and colliding in that group. And our only rules are really be nice and attack ideas and not people. And that's not always easy to do running the group. So if you are part of a big Facebook group or you're the moderator of one, it's not an easy job. But I think it's very cool that we can share ideas really across the world in just an instant. So what's the why for this webinar? What are we going to talk about here tonight? What I hope to add value to for you is really understand and bring awareness to the reality of the current state of the dental world and how it's affecting dentists, hygienists, team members, and patients. So we are all in this wacky dental world together. It's not an easy place to be. There's a lot of outside forces that are affecting what's happening, whether it's insurances, whether it's patient perception. There's also internal forces, whether it's dentist. If you've noticed, maybe you're listening to this webinar and you've been in dentistry uh, 40 years, that's how old I am, 40 years old, or just one year, you notice that Dentists don't spend a lot of time talking to each other about their practices, about what's going on, and that's an isolating feeling. Same thing with hygienists and team members. So this is Daphne just down the beach last week. Uh, she is, I don't know if anybody knows that look, she is trying to break a pinata so candy will come out. So uh, what is going to come out of this webinar? So I do wanna say up front, I mean, I'm on our team, uh, I think hygienists are awesome people. And I think hygienists have signed up to do uh, a very difficult job and I'm grateful for it. I have not done a profi in definitely the last decade. I can't remember. I'm one of those dentists who don't do uh, profis. Doesn't mean if you're a dentist who do do profis or anything wrong with it, but you have to care a lot if you're going to be doing profis and cleaning teeth and scaling and replaning. And also uh, as a hygienist, if you were an assistant before being a hygienist, dentists and hygienists have very different jobs. So dentists, we have a lot more that can go wrong on our patients, so that can be stressful, but we can get a lot of things done very quickly. If you ever watch your dentist do a filling, sometimes only with the patient for like eight or nine minutes, and I know you guys are with the patients for 30, 40, 50 minutes, and I know there can be a lot of questions from the patients, a lot of complaining. They could be sharing very unique things about their life that you're not sure why they're sharing them with you, the hygienist, so I just wanna say that I really appreciate that and really are an important part of the team and helping our patients really like the office because nowadays as we'll get to later in the webinar i truly believe like daphne you see her there jumping on the beach um perhaps you know hopefully if i'm a dentist you won't have any any cavities maybe i will uh be embarrassed if she does but i know that happens to everyone but if you think about it uh, as a hygienist think about your patients over the past week think about your patients over the past month think about your patients over the past year how many patients or human beings under 40 needed a lot of dental work and if you think about that for a minute, really, it's pretty low. I mean, it's a good thing for public health. It's in general, patients aren't coming in needing three root canals, three crowns at a young age. So really the hygienists, you guys are connecting our practice to the patients. And when patients walk around our town in Pennington and say, I have the best dentist, what they really mean is they have the best hygienist because a lot of them just see me for a few minutes at the end of the visit. And all they're hoping um, I do is not say that there's anything wrong and they really get to know, uh, know you guys. So, you know, we do need to have shared goals, you know, just like a parent, there's Mary and Daphne down the shore. I mean, you, as part of a family, you need to have shared goals. As part of a dental office, you need to have shared goals. We all, we have to figure out how we can navigate this changing world together. And sometimes a lot of what's shared goals have to have some shared understanding. And I think dentists do a particularly bad job of explaining what's going on with the office, whether it's just with money or trends in my office. I'm pretty transparent about what happens. It doesn't mean that I doesn't mean that your dentist should or needs to tell you exactly how much money they make or exactly how much money someone else makes, but the general trends of the office uh, should be shared with the team because you know just like in a family it should be shared and 
you know, maybe you can encourage your dentist to do that in a safe way and in a way that uh, really shows that you're, you know, care about the office, care about a success, but you really want to understand. And we'll talk about some of those numbers here tonight. One of the things I was asked in preparing for this, you know, uh, webinar is how hygienists can be more valuable to their uh, office. And I think as the changing nature of the, the I think the hygienists are, what the hygienists do is going to change, I think, relatively dramatically over the next decade, because the cleanings that you do are probably going to get a lot easier on patients who have healthy mouths. But then you'll be seeing patients who are older who have been living a long time. And you see this now where at the end of their life, they're getting cavities because why are they getting cavities at age 85? You know, or age 80, they have less saliva. They have medications that cause decreased saliva. They just can't clean their teeth as easily. I mean, that's just normal. I mean, I, I was kind of, you know, on the beach, uh, there's a lot of young kids. And if I compare my flexibility to some of these 12 year olds, it's embarrassing. So just as we all go through this aging process, they can't clean their teeth as well, but they think they're, they're trying. So that's one of the hard, hard parts. You know, the, you, there's no one who really takes better care of their teeth than hygienist. And uh, I know you guys are at the top of the top with caring for your teeth and flossing and brushing, probably much better than dentists, but most, most patients don't really even know how and sometimes don't have the dexterity or hand skills at an older age to really keep their teeth clean. So you know, night, if you can, if you can talk about or mention, I always say, talk about, you know, with my hygienist, they don't have to diagnose everything or, you know, sell a big case. I don't really even like that, that term, but if they can mention things about night guards with wear using um, intro pictures, crowns and single tooth posterior implants that can just be, have a huge impact on the office. And the mention's a big help because you're planting a seed, you're getting a patient to think about it. And a uh, the reality is patients like you a lot better than the dentist and you have a better relationship with them. So if you say, Hey, you know what, Mrs. Smith, a lot of our patients get implants and really like them. And yes, it is expensive, but they think it's worth it. That's a great soundbite. So, you know, if you want to just a take home nacho tip, if you just insert a uh, procedure and say, Hey, a lot of our patients uh, need night guards because they want to protect their teeth. You don't want to have to replace all your teeth when you're 60 or 70. Uh, when I was young, a younger dentist, I would say, uh, you know, you don't want your teeth to wear down, you're going to need crowns, you're going to have to, you know, you're not, your bite's going to collapse. No one really cared about that. So now I say to a 45 year old with where I say, well, when you're 65, what would you rather do? Uh, get new crowns for $40,000 or go on a great European vacation to Paris or France? And they say the vacation I say, okay, well, get a night guard. And then that's kind of holding out, you know, they say people can only be motivated with a carrot or a stick. I say like carrot, who wants a carrot? It's kind of boring. So you can either be motivated with nachos or a stick. So in that world, I'm kind of using both of those. If you don't use this night guard, you're going to have to spend your money on something you don't want to do instead of something fun. So those are all just things that you can practice or team meetings or practice sound bites. You can write down just little notes for yourself to make comparisons and just help the patients feel confident about what you guys offer because that's what you want to do. You know, you patients who get dental implants are in general, happy that they got them. They have another tooth to chew with. They never can never get a cavity. I mean, that's one of the things I highlight when I talk to people about implant patients is um, the, um, you know, the value of like a tooth can get a cavity, a tooth can lose bone or a tooth could break. So that's one of the things I tell my team to say. So there's only three things that can happen to a tooth. So if you want a take home nacho tip, what can happen to a tooth? They can get a cavity, they could lose bone or it could break. And if we look at this picture here, and we have two natural teeth in a dental implant, the natural teeth can get the cavity, it can lose bone, and it can break. But the implant, no matter what happens, cannot get a cavity, rarely loses significant bone. So I know sometimes your hygienists have been working for a long time, see dental implants with bone loss, but they're stable. And can they break? And not in general, they don't. You know, there's, there's small problems that happen with them. Doesn't mean implants are perfect. Doesn't mean that nothing goes wrong with them. But if you look in patients' mouths, they have a lot more trouble keeping up with teeth long-term in their 70s and 80s. So that's just something that you can suggest, recommend, mention uh, about posterior implants. So while we want to help patients, we also want to help ourselves. So you might be thinking, um, this is great to help patients, but I also like to help myself. And how do we help ourselves? All of us would like to make more money. And there's nothing to you know, be ashamed of for that. Everyone you know, wants to do better. Uh, you want to make more money for a lot of reasons. Support your family, do things. The dentist wants to do that too. So Posterior dental implants represent the biggest source of uh, revenue in a general practice because uh, restoring a posterior dental implant 
uh, has three main benefits. It's low stress chair side procedure for the dentist and the patient. So in general, it's taking impressions, using a screwdriver, it's fairly simple. It generates a lot of revenue. So some of you may look at your day sheets and we'll have multiple webinars on these topics where we can dig into different topics and different in detail, but this is sort of a broad based one, but all of you may have a day sheet or sheet that you look at at the end of the day that say, okay, my prophes, my bite wings, my fluoride, my scaling and root planing, I produce $2,000. And one of the things that we have to think about is just because you produce $2,000 doesn't mean the office can collect $2,000. Now that we'll talk about that in a little while, but you may spend an entire day doing everything it is that you do, seeing all of those patients, taking those x-rays, getting all those things done for $2,000, and a dentist can just restore one single tooth dental implant in 40 minutes and produce that same amount. So if you can help the office do that, you just help the office make more money in the same amount of time. So if I asked you, we're not in a classroom, but if I asked you, raise your hand if you'd like to make more money. If you're at home, uh, you could raise your hand to participate. Now, keep your hand up if you wanna work more hours and most people do not want to work more hours. They want to make more money in the same amount of hours. So the only way offices can do that is to do more productive procedures in the hours that they're open. And single teeth dental implants is an example of that, especially in the posterior, because it's low stress chair side procedure, high revenue producing procedure, and rewarding for the patient and the team. So we have some sponsors tonight. It's not a CE course, but some sponsors have helped us here. So one first fun thing here, uh, our office has used Solution Reach for six or seven years, patient management texting, newsletters. To me, it has been fantastic when there's office changes. Uh, no, not everybody really likes changes. I, I understand sometimes I don't like changes. It's true. I'm sure one day the cell phone is going to be replaced by the hologram phone, and I'm not going to want to use the hologram phone in my daughter death is to be like, you're such an old man, dad, you don't use the hologram phone. You don't, you know, send holograms, you just text. So I get it. But when I wanted to bring in solution reach, uh, six years ago, my team said, no, one's going to want that. They want us to call them so they can hear our voices. And that was just them being resistant to change. So I said, let's try it. And now if solution reach goes down for a day, they get really upset because if sometimes in our office on a Monday, we'll have 52 appointments and over 30 are confirmed via solution reach. So I know these, Patient management systems do a lot of different things. I've sent email newsletters to people on implants, but to us with patient communication, um, it has been great. So you can win a gift card, a $50 gift card. All you need to do is email Ariel at dentalnachos.com and say you'd like to be in the running for the gift card. And the only thing to do is to put, uh, to make me know that you were here is to put Daphne in the subject line because that's my daughter's name. So if you put Daphne gift card, one of you out there will win a $50 gift card and Aaron will pick that and send that to you. So Solution Reach has been a great thing in our office and I recommend dentists are hard to change. So you may be working with someone who you say, ah, oh, they will never do this. I just tell people this, and this is a good thing with change is why don't you try this for 30 days? If you don't like it for 30 days, we can change it. And a lot of these programs have money back guarantees anyway, whether it's a Solution Reach or a product. And you might, you know, change your office forever in a way that brings it makes low, decreases stress and brings in more money. So, what is the current dental problem about? Like, where are we, and what are some of the problems with the economics of dentistry? So, over the past three years, uh, general dentists are working the same amount of hours. We're producing more, but we're collecting less. And one of the take-home messages I have here tonight. One of the things, if you're one of the people in your office who looks at numbers and reports, is to identify the insurance gap. So every year, your office should raise fees. There's ways, different ways to analyze that. We're not going to talk all about it tonight, but let's just use a crown that your office charges $1,000 for. We're just going to use that as an example. 2017, it charges $1,000. 2018, it's going to charge $1,050. Insurance, spoiled guacamole PPO pays $800 for the crown. So what happens is they, they don't pay, I'm sorry, they don't pay $800, they allow $800. So they allow $800, patient pays 400, uh, insurance pays 400, and the dental office has to write off 200. And the write off is the insurance gap. So the insurance gap is the difference between the charged fee and the insurance allowed fee. So in that case of the $1,000 crown down to 800, the gap would be 200. Now in 2018, we're going to raise that P to 1,050, but the insurance still pays 800. So now the gap is $250. So for the first time in dentistry, insurance 
insurances are not raising fees. And in some areas, which sounds crazy, they are lowering their fees. So instead of paying 800 in, instead of paying 800 in 2018, they're actually paying 750. So they are going in the opposite direction. What's hard about that for a dental office is they can't change a lot of their fixed costs. I mean, they can't change if they went to you and said, Hey, I'll just use Ariel because she works with me. I use her name. Hey, Ariel. Um, you know, usually as a hygienist, we're going to pay you $36 an hour, but this patient is a spoiled guac PPO and only pays us 70%. So we're just going to pay you 70% of your hourly wage. A hygienist would be upset and I understand why you'd be upset. But one thing that you can maybe just uh, relate to or sympathize, empathize, whatever the right word is with your dentist is they have all different hours. If they're doing a full fee crown, maybe they're getting a thousand dollars. If they're doing an insurance one, it's only 650. So they're working for 65% of what their list fee is. So this insurance gap here in one of our offices, if you just follow along here in 2012, this is what our satellite insurance base office produced. Doesn't matter really what this side here, this could be a million dollars. This could be up to $500,000. But look at how close this is. So the gap between what we produced and what patients paid was very small. So that means that our write-offs for the insurance gap were pretty minor. Now, as we go along here, we're producing more. And what's really toxic here is in 2014, this here is actually higher than this over here. And then we produce a little bit more over here. But as you can see, what we can collect stays relatively the same. So this gap is getting bigger. So we're producing more, we're collecting less, and that's really causing a big problem for dentists and their way they're running their offices because the insurance gap is dictating what they can charge and they're not able to really get that difference anywhere else. They can only get, you know, they can't really pay their staff less. They can't pay less for supplies. They can't pay less for rent. So this is a problem and you see this a lot of times this has happened to doctors, this happened to pharmacists and it's kind of to be determined as to how this is going to happen, what's going to happen next, but I don't see it getting better. So when we get to the Q and A sections, if you, if you have some questions about that, I'd be happy to answer. So that's why, you know, the office seems so busy you know, on our team. We seem, we seem busy, but we don't, they don't totally understand. I try to share with them, but we're actually making less profit. So being busy, does not indicate how much profit you're making because when we're busy and you're, those of you who've been dentist for, I've been in the dental field for a long time, busy usually just means crazy. It means there's emergencies coming in, patients are back, backing up. But you know, those of you who've worked with maybe a dentist who does a lot of crowns or implants, a lot of times when they're doing big cases, it's very calm. And you know, placing two implants, restoring implants, that's when it's calm and productive. Uh, unfortunately, when it's busy, it's kind of unproductive because we're doing a lot of little things trying to catch up, especially as general dentists. So that's one of the um, problems there. As we talked about before, humans under the age of 40 have great teeth. They get their two cleanings by insurance, but they don't have any other work to do. So this is great for society, but really it's an economic problem for dentists and hygienists. Because if, if you took your car in every six months, and all you ever needed was an oil change, your mechanic would have a big problem. So mechanics bank on engine problems, brake problems, tire problems. So dentists, from an economic perspective, have to fix problems to make money. And the hygiene department of cleaning teeth is, is a maintenance department, no different when you take your car in. So it's important, but it's not super productive. And additionally, the, the percentage of non-insurance patients is getting smaller. So in our practice, uh, we had at one point, 33% of our patients had no insurance. So what that meant is they paid full fee. There was no adjustments to what they do. And now we're down to, I think, under 15%, maybe 15 to 16% because everyone insurance is a buzzword. As you guys know, they talk about insurance and dental insurance isn't insurance. One thing I tell my team to say is that instead of saying dental insurance, it's like a dental coupon. Because when you go to Bed Bath & Beyond, you don't expect that coupon to get you everything in the store. But people come in and they need a crown and they need a root canal and they say, I don't understand why my insurance doesn't cover it. And that's because medical insurance is insurance. If you have to go to the hospital and there's a $100,000 charge, you max out at $2,000 and your insurance pays the rest. Dental office, it's totally the opposite. You could have $10,000 worth of dental work and uh, the insurance will pay $1,500 and you're on, the, on your own for the rest. So maybe for some of you that have been working for many years, 
and this is kind of you know just totally nuts. Uh, the insurance maximums haven't changed. I mean, in the 1980s, when it was $1,500 maximum, that would pay for about three crowns. Nowadays, that would, you know, to keep pace, we should have about $4,000 maximums, $5,000 maximums. But most of you know who process insurance, they're still $1,500 to $2,000. So what insurance can even get the patient is a lot, lot less. So I use it like this, 40 years old, trying to stay in shape, dad, busy dad, doing things. It's like, if you were on the treadmill eating ice cream, you would not be getting more fit. You would not, it kind of sounds fun to do. I might not want to be on the treadmill eating ice cream, but it would not be a good, good for my um, exercise routine. But that's kind of what we're doing in the office. We're working hard, but the insurance is packing calories, more calories into our you know, food, if you want to use food as the reimbursement, and we're not making much progress. So we're trying to get in summer shape. It's the summer, but we're gaining a few pounds, and we're not quite sure what to do because we're all trying hard and we're all busy and we're all doing stuff, but it just doesn't seem like we're getting the results uh, that we need. Some of the things that some of the companies that I partner with, another one is local med and you can um, email, email Ariel for uh, information on that. That's been one of the best things that we've done because this is just this magical patient scheduling system where we've been able to get new patients, reactivate patients. So if you're in an office where your schedule's not that busy or they're still sending out just postcards, not that there's anything wrong with a postcard, there's just ways to reactivate patients that you need to see and bring in new patients to the office. And new patients usually come in at a time where they may have some acute dental care if they haven't been in for a while, not that I'm hoping they have that, but it might be an opportunity for the, for the dentist to do more work. So. Uh, that's a company that I, uh, I work with and have a referral relationship with, local med. And most of the people, if not every person I've referred to them, has really been satisfied because it allows patients to schedule directly online, not request an appointment, actually schedule it. And you will see people are scheduling dental appointments at very odd times of the day because I will get, a, I get emails about them. And at 4 a.m., someone's scheduling their cleaning or at 1 a.m. So people are thinking about the dental office at weird times. And they don't want to call up and talk to someone and say, can I come in at 2? Can I come in at 10 a.m.? Oh, you want to do Wednesday? They just want to go online and uh, schedule. So why, patient, why dentists are seeing more patients and making less? Uh, we're going to get to some of the questions you guys put in. And then we're going to do like some of your Q&As in the chat. So I've, I've accumulated some questions. And one of the questions submitted for this webinar, why are dentists seeing more patients and making less profit? As we've talked about, Dentists can be producing more. Dentists can be raising their own fees, but insurance companies are not keeping pace and in some ways are going in the opposite direction. So this gap is causing us a big problem. How the impact of PPO insurance is making it difficult slash impossible to give hygienists pay increases or raises. So I know some of you are sitting here thinking like, I would like to get a raise. I deserve a raise. I work so hard. And I, your dentist would agree in feeling. I mean, they would say, you are working hard and we do like having you in the office, but your dentist is likely, not only are they not getting a raise themselves, they're taking a pay cut because when the office, the dentist has to pay all of the bills that they always pay, take care of everything before they're paid. And when there's just not enough left over for them, sometimes they might not take any money in a payroll. Now it doesn't mean they don't make any money for the year, but uh, if you look at the accountants and you look at uh, statistics and you talk to them, the dentist income, what they're making is actually declining. And that's not easy on a dentist because as you see, running an office takes a lot of work, a lot of stress, a lot of decisions, a lot of things go wrong. People have to call out, people's family's sick, people have challenges, and it's just a lot of behind the scenes effort to run a dental office. And the dentist would like to make more money too as part of a reward and feeling good about themselves, but the PPO insurances are really making that difficult to do. How can hygienists make themselves ultra valuable to a dental office? Uh, I think this is a great question asked by some people out there. Um, by doing things that can help the office make more money in the same amount of time. And one of those, some, an example of that was talking about dental implants, maybe taking a course on, on implants and making that something that you want to know about. Talking about elective services, night guards, bleaching, cosmetic dentistry and looking to fill in the gaps in the office with work that needs to be done. So maybe asking to be cross-trained where you go up and say, I know I don't do this, but I would love to not, maybe you won't love, maybe I'd like to learn how to file insurance claims. And you know, now with a lot of paperless offices, uh, hygien hygienists used to go to the front desk and help with charts and things like that, but there might not be any charts in your office. But I think it's really just cool that you can learn some business aspects and you never know, maybe you'll be an office manager as you get older and you don't want to clean teeth, maybe you get bored of cleaning teeth. Um, there's 
you know, different companies you could work for as reps. So there's just, I mean, I think hygienists is still a great job and it still gives you a lot of potential, but you have this one thing that you do well, clean teeth, do scaling and root planning. And if the patient doesn't show up for an hour, what are you going to do to add value to the office uh, there? So sometimes there's systems that you can work on and feel free to email me or Ariel if you want some more specific examples. So I'm going to do uh, one more thing here and then we'll take some chat questions. I have some more loaded up too. So in-house financing, in-house savings plans is something we've adopted in our office. Uh, Clear is an example of that. Also uh, QDP was one that we're familiar with. Um, recently I've been trying to embrace Clear because Clear allows the patient to pay monthly for their in-house savings plan. So it's not insurance and there's a lot of rules you have to read. You really, you can't just sell insurance as a dental office. So it's an in-house savings plan. But what it does is have patients pay up front for cleanings, exams, x-rays, uh, and emergency exams, and then they will get a percentage discount off the rest of their treatment. So the reason this is so magical is that if I told you sitting there, you have no insurance right now, you need an implant start to finish for $4,000, you'd say, oh, geez, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. If you were part of the in-house savings plan and your office offered 10%, you immediately would say, well, 4,000, oh, but I have that 10% in-house savings plan. I'm only gonna pay $3,600. And just humans love a deal. We all do, whether it's on an implant or whether it's on bags at the King of Prussia Mall or whether it's on a golf round or whether it's on a car. So uh, the in-house savings plan, if you do not have that in your office, I would explore it. I tell students, residents, hygienists, dentists, that anything that I recommend or bring to you to investigate or explore, you don't have to use it. You don't have to think it's the best thing ever, but these are things that I've incorporated that have tried, that have helped our practice and we're all out there working each day. So you might as well try some things new. I know dentists sometimes are unwilling to do so, but if you encourage them and you hold that nacho up to them instead of a carrot and say, hey, there's dentists using in-house savings plans and it's, it's helping the patients say yes to more treatment. It's helping them come in for their recall visits regularly. I'll look into it myself. So one of the things I would love for my team to do if they brought this to me and said, I would like to do clear, it's a free demo, let me learn about it. The dentist sometimes says, oh geez, another thing that I have to think about. So then you say, I'll look into the whole thing for you. And if you look into the whole thing for them on it, when you don't have a patient or sometimes you might just look into it on your own time. And I know it's, you know, you think, oh, you know, why would I do something on my own time for the office and not get paid? Because sometimes it helps you and, you know, it's not that difficult to do. So, it, you know, usually there's time during office time to do that, but maybe it's sometimes you'll do a demo yourself, you know, during a lunch break. And uh, if you bring something like that to a dentist, they don't forget if it turns out well. And that really just is a, a great thing to do, positive contact uh, for the office. So let's... Uh, Take a break here and go to your questions in chat. Evan may have accumulated some, and I have some more questions we can go over for the last uh, 25 minutes too. Okay, Bonnie, Bonnie um, asks, what is the ADA doing to help dentists with this crazy insurance issue? So really excellent question, and you guys can uh, I'll say, hi, hey Bonnie, thanks for um, saying hi too. Uh, what the, ADA is doing, there's a couple of things to think about. So first of all, I went to the ADA in October and I signed up for the insurance lecture and I said, okay, I am going to learn what's happening. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm not that emotional person. It was rather depressing because I did a podcast with Lance Timmerman. So if you want to email me, I will send you the podcast link where I told him the top 10 things I learned that were depressing from the ADA. And unfortunately, I don't think the ADA has first, I don't know if they have the power to truly make an impact. Um, they may have more power than we think. I still, I just, just transparent. I am an ADA member. I think I am one of those people who thinks it's better than nothing. I don't know if that's exactly the right way to think, but at least they're trying to do something. But some things that they said were, you don't have to sign up for a bad insurance plan, which I just didn't like at all because you guys know in your areas, if you don't take an insurance plan, spoil guac people, PPO, Nacho Inc. If everyone has that plan and you go out of network with it, the patients will leave. In my own, in my own um, office, we change status. I don't call it dropping with a big insurance plan and 90% of the uh, patients went to another office. Now we did keep it in our satellite office, but it was a little disheartening. You know, I knew a lot would leave, but these were patients who had sometimes been at the office for 30 years. They went to our satellite office and we have an awesome associate there. But they said, oh, if my insurance takes is taken over there, I'm going to go. And it's a little scary because that means that 
they're following their insurance more than the dentist that they know, but that's just how they've been conditioned. So the ABA, uh, I don't think they're doing themselves a favor with their PR because they're not even, they're not even really sharing what they're trying to do. There may be some things they're trying to do, but I don't hear about them. I mean, I see like, uh, uh, what is it like the pecan is advertised on the Super Bowl and it seems like whoever's in charge of the pecan they're getting good PR for that we need something like that some really good direct to patient advertisements but it's a it's a political organization with a lot of different moving parts and pieces so good question I, I I'm not really emboldened by what the ADA is going to do over the next five to ten years but I will stay a member for the time being but good question Bonnie uh, when is the best time to ask for a raise? So that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I don't think asking at the end of the year for a raise is a good idea because a lot of things go on at the end of the year. It's sort of become this obligatory thing. I think dentists from previous generations just would check off this box and give their team raises each year because they were making more money. And what happens is the team just expected that and you wound up taking it for granted. I think if you ask for a raise in your office, you really have to explain the why. And it's gotta be explained with some sort of numbers. It can't be explained with like, I'm working so hard, I'm trying so hard, I'll do anything for this office. Those are all nice things, but they're just feelings. What it would have to be like is, I've been tracking what I've been producing over the past three months, and it's a lot more than the previous three months, and here's why. What I'm really trying to do, uh, Dr. Nacho, is talk to patients about night guards and implants and scaling and root planing. I really believe that it's helping our patients, it's helping us. I mean, it can be a win-win. And I have accumulated, Dennis says, I've accumulated my production, my collection, and it's more than it is in the past. So if you can, if you can share the why as to why you would deserve a raise or why it makes sense to give you one, you may win that argument. But if it's, or you may win, you know, getting a raise. But if it's just based on feelings or expectations, that doesn't really work well in dental offices, marriages, friendships. It's got to be about the why based on some rational um, parts. So uh, if no one has any more questions, we'll keep moving along here. Let me see here one second. We may have one more question. Keep asking your questions as we go along. I'm happy to answer those. They're more fun for me. Um, Keep going with this? No. Okay, perfect. Um, so still feel free to um, keep submitting questions to Evan, but I'll just go through some of the pre-submitted questions. So let's just go through, and I want to thank another per, uh, company that sponsors me for things. I don't know if you have used Keatonbach um, materials, but they're just an awesome company. They've supported a lot of things that I do. Uh, one of the things I think really works well for hygiene is that uh, you could take impressions for uh, night guards, bleaching trays, counter models, you have to check the rules. I don't know if you can do the night guard you know, impression for the arch that it's gonna go on, you may be able to. But one of the things that's great is that you do not need to pour this up right away. It's not alginate, it stays stable. We have our lab do it and not charge us a model charge. So if you would like some free Siljanot, um, our rep will be happy to send you some. Just email Ariel at Dental Nachos and say, I'd like some Siljanot. And you could try that, because maybe you say to a, um, uh, one at your dentist, you know, I, I went ahead, I took impressions for bleaching trays because I know the patient's getting married. I went ahead and took impressions to look at this implant case. And even if the dentist doesn't want to be using it for something, they'll appreciate your, your initiative. Uh, sometimes you can ask if you can help the dentist or assistants with impressions. So that's just a good tool for hygienists to have. But to go back here, um, it's clear, okay. So some of the things I've talked about for the future of hygiene, I really see that, uh, a real challenge coming soon now let's say you work in an office with two hygienists let's just use this example you work in an office with two hygienists and each hygienist makes forty dollars an hour just to use that and uh, you each have your own column of patients and you each see eight patients a day and you work for eight hours so the dentist is going to pay you three hundred and twenty dollars and your counterpart three hundred and twenty dollars for a total of six hundred and forty dollars to see 16 patients I do see uh, coming down sooner rather than later is giving hygienists two rooms. Some of you may say, oh, that sounds great. I like to have two rooms, but it comes with a cost because maybe you'll get a $16 an hour assistant and you may have to see close to 16 patients. You may not have to see all 16, but I, I do see that they're in, a, in, a, in an office with good systems that the hygienist could see the patient for 30 minutes, only do the cleaning, not do the other things, have the assistant 
do the other parts of it and it wouldn't be as good a service as you do now. You wouldn't know the patients as well. But if you think about it, that dentist is going to pay you $320 and it's going to, and going to pay the um, assistant $108 and is going to save over $200 a day on paying a second hygienist. And if you take $200 a day and multiply it by $200 for the year, the dentist is going to save $40,000 and possibly not, you know, just have a total profit on that. And that's not easy though. I mean, I wouldn't, don't think it would be easy to clean 16 adult patients teeth in a day, but I see a real issue with if you're a hygienist and you're used to getting an hour per patient and insurance is reducing the fee, what is the office going to do to try to keep to, to survive? And I think working out of two rooms may be um, one of the answers. Maybe some of you guys do that now. Is there any other new question? Let me see. That was, that was going to second. There's a question. Let's see here. Oh, okay. Gotcha. How many hygienists do you employ? Just wondering how much time does your hygienist get per patient? Good question. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, we employ at least four hygienists in different capacities and we have, it's a good question, in our fee-for-service office, uh, they get 60 minutes per patient. And in our satellite PPO office, they get 45 minutes. In our satellite PPO office, one thing that I did when I came into the office, we have a roving dental assistant. I believe that hygienists should stay on time all the time. It's hard to do it by yourself. So we have a roving dental assistant dedicated to helping hygienists with instruments, um, seating patients. It's the most important thing to me in my practices for hygiene patients to be seated on time. And the hygienist uh, should be focusing on the things that only the hygienist could do, talking to the patients about the procedures, um, recommending treatment, doing their hygiene work. So I know a lot of offices aren't like that. Someone asked a good question. I think a floating assistant is great, but some dentists don't see that. Uh, the floating assistant does more than just help hygienists. They you know, help dentists, they help with a lot of ways, but uh, we employ about four to five hygienists and 60 minutes in our fee-for-service office, 45 minutes in our satellite PPO. Yeah, I love the roving dental assistant. I do too. We can't operate without it. Um, I believe every any office that implements a roving dental assistant is, gonna, is going to um, um, going to make more money and decrease stress over a year. But initially, it is an expense and dentists sometimes I call it dentist cheap and uh, dentist cheap to me is that they say something's expensive, but they don't look at the total picture and they might say, I don't want that silicone material because it's more expensive than alginate. But if we did a cost study, it's going to save them money, but they don't want to see that cost study. They just want to be dentist cheap about it. So I call dentists out for being that way, dentist cheap. And it's not an easy battle to uh, do depending on how well you know your dentist and comfort level. You may start to encourage them to think about some of these things. Uh, some other questions, why not use the in-house plan to get monthly payments for patients rather than patients paying for insurance, cut out the middleman? Great. It's a great question. I do think that can happen over time. Two th well, first of all, I think adopting an in-house savings plan is a good idea. Whether you use QDP, whether you use Clear, whether you do it yourself, I don't recommend doing it yourself for this reason. Some dentists say, I'm not going to pay a company, I'm just going to do it myself. It's, it's not going to look the same when you don't have another company doing it. Uh, to me, sometimes that's dentist cheap. I would like to go into those offices and I bet you the people paying companies actually have more people on their plan because it just feels different. Clear is it has actually an app and kind of a very advanced one. And I don't think anyone can do that in their office. The reason you can't, patients are unwilling to go on an in-house savings plan when, they're, when, they're, when their job provides an insurance because they feel like it's a good deal. Now their job providing insurance might not be a good deal but you have to have sympathy for them because sometimes they don't know how much they're paying for dental versus medical. They don't know if it's $40 a month, but as you're sitting there listening, whether you're on the live webinar, or you're listening to this recording, what's totally crazy is if someone pays $40 a month for insurance, just using that example, and that's total of 480, we'll call it $500 a year. So they pay $500 a year for the chance to get $1,500 in coverage. So all of this, uh, effort and expense and chaos just to maybe get a thousand dollars when usually they don't max it out it just is it's it's not worth all the craziness so hopefully over time if you use in-house savings plans you can start to just shift the mindset of your patients i don't think it's going to be easy for that to happen but that's a good question uh 
Am I further had to ask for an hourly bonus or raise? If I ask for a bonus, how do I know when I will get that bonus? What kind of numbers to keep track of? Great question again. I, I, I hope to do like, you know, a series of these one hour webinars and then kind of build on them. I think we should save the commission versus hourly pay till the next one. Uh, from our offices, we really just do hourly pay. Uh, we've been in office for 40 years. We haven't really embraced the system where we pay the hygienist percentage of their commission, but I percentage of their collections. But I do see that being a real thing. But hygienists who maybe, I don't know if you could say, if you want to say if you're on commission out there, if you want to t type in the chat box, if you like being on commission instead of hourly, I see a hygienist being on a commission this way. You know, I own an office, uh, Dr. Nacho's dental office in Center City, Philadelphia. I want to hire a hygienist and hygienist says, I want to make $37 an hour. I say, I don't do that here. We pay you 20 bucks an hour and we pay you 30% of your collections. And we won't pay you less than 20 bucks an hour, but you might make $50 an hour one month. You might make $27 an hour one month. So I was a, I was a, a food server for many years. I loved that job. But I knew sometimes I made 80 bucks on a shift, sometimes I made 250. So getting paid on commission is a different, is a different, um, uh, just a whole different, whole different world of being paid than what hourly is. RDH is getting 1099. I mean, that's a good question. We never do that. I don't understand that. That's like another dentist cheap thing. Uh, to me, it's, it's just, I'm a real math guy. So just for if you're out there and you're hygienist, 1099ing a hygienist, putting that aside as whether that fits with the IRS definitions or not, probably doesn't, but I'm not an accountant or an attorney. If I was going to pay Evan as a 1099 employee and I was going to pay him $40 an hour as a 1099, that means he has to pay probably 7% of his own taxes. So let's just call that $3 an hour for this webinar example. So $40 an hour as a, as a 1099 is like the same as $37 an hour as an employee in general, broad brushstrokes. The dentist is being dentist cheap when they pay you $37 as a 1099. So being paid $40 an hour as a 1099 versus $37 as a W-2, kind of the same math. There is an issue of when you're not W-2, you're not a commuting social security, you wanna talk with your accountant. I have to agree with you, Bonnie, I, I don't do it. So it's just not a factor for me. Uh, Sometimes I think dentists hassle themselves for no reason, but I know that's a popular thing um, for uh, dentists, dentists to do and uh, just not something that I do. So I appreciate you asking that. Anybody else, uh, any questions? We can always hop back to the PowerPoint. Um, so I just hit this for that. All right, great. So I have some questions here. Anybody thinking of anything? So, you know, the tough love I give you, just like dentists, I mean, if you look at your dentist, I mean, if my hygienist, you know, they want to listen to this webinar, hi, hi, hygienist from Pennington and Ewing Dental, you guys are great. Uh, they want to have seen me though, and know me, I mean, they know I'm like, you know, I like to think, they think I'm a good person, they like to think I'm somebody who cares about people, and they observe what we're doing, and if they see my brother and I, you know, the associates are, are a lot newer, so they might not know a different world, but seven years ago, we worked less and made more money. Now we're working more and making less money. So hygienists, you're probably going to be in the same boat. So if you're somebody who's 43 years, 40 years old, like me as a hygienist, and you used to make $40 an hour seeing eight patients a day, you may make $40 an hour seeing 12 patients a day. And that's just the tough love. I mean, I, I, I wish it was different, but I don't foresee a world where that's not going to be possible because what's going to happen, just like this is happening to dentists, is there's going to be new hygienists who don't make any money and they're out of hygiene school. And if a dentist says, we'll pay you $32 an hour and you guys want $40 an hour, they're going to hire the newer hygienist, not because they don't like a medium age hygienist like me. It's because it's a math issue. And they might say to you, would you work for $32 an hour? And you'd say, well, I don't want to do that because I used to make 40. But then if you go around and around and around and you don't see any positions for $40 an hour, you could be in a difficult place. So um, that's just part of my tough love uh, example there. I've seen more patients and making the same amount of money. Uh, how can we be more profitable? It goes back to, to dental implants. Um, there's a lot of patients above the age of 65 who are gonna fracture their roots. So they've had teeth for 45 years, root canal and crown. There's a fistula, meaning the roots fractured. 
the more confidence you can put into the patient in a very genuine way about replacing that tooth with the dental implant, the better that's going to be for the office and that patient. I will have to tell, I will tell you someone who's done probably thousands of implant cases. So I've done implant cases for people. Uh, they paid anywhere from $4,000 up to like $75,000. When the implant case is done, they don't regret spending the money. I mean, they don't want more implants. They don't necessarily want to spend it on that instead of vacation, but they believe they see its value. They have a tooth to chew with. They have dentures to snap in. So to me, that is something we all have to embrace as a dental world to maintain our profitability and just tell people. We talked about Keatonbach. So anybody have any questions here in the last like nine minutes? I can just go through this here. Just want to see if there's any one, any live ones. They're more fun to answer. So by what kind of numbers do you need to keep track of to deserve a raise? So the, really the numbers, you just want to, I actually say to all associates and hygienists, in our office, you cannot leave the office, owners included, unless you initial your day sheet, because I went to a good seminar and they said 7% of dental procedures are never charged out. So you don't want to charge a patient for x-rays when you didn't take them, because that's unintentional fraud, but it's still fraud. But you also don't want to not charge for x-rays when you did take them. So we initial our day sheets and I would keep an, ex I would keep a copy of all of your day sheets. You know, there's probably HIPAA HIP issues. You don't have to keep the patient's name, but I would keep a, a copy of your production and then sometimes ask and say, Hey, let me see what happened with these patient numbers. I mean, in our Pat satellite PPO office, if you're listening, uh, we might charge $200 for a hygiene service, like $200. And the insurance only allows us to collect $107. And I mean, it's, it's a really big problem because we're definitely not making money on that. And I don't know how long we can sustain keeping that plan. And when you start dropping insurance plans, it actually hurts the hygienist the most because you start dropping busyness and you start dropping cleanings and hygienists might start losing days. So it's very difficult. Sometimes dentists, and maybe you guys will have seen this, they could rearrange their office from four days, from four and a half days to three days. And the dentist could make the same amount of money. But as a hygienist, you're paid for four and a half days. You only work for three. You're not going to make the same amount. So that's a really a big challenge. Uh, I do. I've learned. I've done implant placement since 2002. I teach courses. I get to teach people uh, how to do their first implant. Uh, so a lot of the implants I get to uh, joyfully be part of placing now are through people placing their own implants because we have an in-house periodontist. So I always say this, if you're a general dentist placing your own implants, it's awesome because you're going to place, let's say, 50 implants a year. Uh, but if you have an in-house specialist, the office will probably place over 100. So the in-house specialist usually wins in that scenario. But I come from a background of doing a lot of implants, so I can know how to talk to the patients, not tell them they have sinus slip. So I, I mean, I love teaching implant courses. Ariel and Evan know um, courses I have coming up. Your dentist, if they take sometimes a $5,000 course on how to place implants and how to talk to patients, they can add another 60, 70, $80,000 of production. So I would encourage your dentist to do that because patients want it. Whether patients and want is a strong word, but patients need it. And then they're happy that they have gotten it done. So a uh, good question there, uh, Bonnie. So in the last like five minutes here, you guys can still throw up some more questions. Um, and this here, we're good here. We'll go back to the presentation. So we went over as a hygienist, when should I ask for an hourly raise? How do I know if and when I'll be able to meet that bonus? Uh, let's save that for webinar number two. Uh, what numbers are I going to keep track of? Uh, we talked about that in general. It's what you're producing, what you're collecting, what the insurance write-offs and gaps are. What kind of questions should you ask and review? Some of the questions should be about you and some should be about the office. You know, what direction is the office going in? What are some things that the office feels are challenges? What are some things that we're doing well? Uh, how can I help create a better culture? You know, a lot of times I know it's not easy, but you know, the, the culture in the office can just become negative and stressed. And if you're someone who's not contributing to that, I do have to say, you know, even if my whole team was here listening that our hygienists are actually the least dramatic people in our office. So I appreciate that. But the reason I think that is, is because hygienists in general have their own room and they have their own place to go to for on a not quiet time, but they have their own place to go to, get away from everybody. But you know, the assistants in front desk, they're kind of right in the line of patient fire all the time. So you have to think that's not easy for them. They don't have a room to, you know, they're done 15 minutes early and you can kind of go into your room, organize stuff, take a breather. But uh, our hygienist calls very little, little drama for us. And I appreciate that. 
Uh, is it illegal for dentists to band together and as an entity refuse to participate with certain insurances until they fix their horrendous reimbursements? Yes, it is illegal. Unfortunately, uh, this isn't necessarily a dental law. It's called collusion. We can't all get together and fix fees. If you just want to know something that's even crazier, the insurance companies legally can share fees. So they can say, hey, we only paid $50 for a profi. The other insurance will say 50, we pay 60 and they can lower to 50. But dentists can't all band together and say, let's drop this bad insurance. So that is really a challenge. Um, dentists don't work well together to begin with and we're not allowed to really, we're, not, we're definitely not allowed to fix fees but there's nothing to say we can't collaborate. There's nothing to say we can't go to see courses together, learn things, become stronger as organizations. But as you know, dentists just don't have a real tendency to, to connect with their fellow dentists. And I think that's why we're in the situation that we're in. You know, in a town where there's eight dentists, sometimes the people do not talk to each other for decades. And that's just uh, kind of sad to me. So I do a lot of things with C, trying to bring dentists together, trying to make dentists be nice to each other. It's not an easy job, but maybe you guys can help me in the, getting your dentist to come to CE and get out there into the world and talk to other dentists. Uh, a few more questions here. As we uh, finish up, what do the part-time hygienists, why do part-time hygienists get the not, not get the same benefits? This is really just a labor law thing. So if somebody's deemed part-time, a lot of times that's deemed under 25 hours a week, doesn't always mean that, but let's just use this example. One hygienist works two and a half days a week for 21 hours. One hygienist works four days a week for 36 hours. The part-time hygienist is not entitled to full-time benefits. And they, you know, we have an employee manual in our office. I like employee manuals. It sets expectations. Doesn't mean everybody likes it, but I think employee manuals are important. Uh, but part-time and full-time just have different uh, qualifications. And that's, to be honest, that's why a lot of dentists um, do not hire a lot of full-time team members because they do not have to pay benefits. And in some ways I can understand some of those things because if you just use an example, if you're, if you're a full-time hygienist and your dentist contributes to your health insurance, $300 a month, that's a $3,600 expense for you that they wouldn't have for two part-time hygienists. Now I'm not saying that you shouldn't have full-time hygienists. We have full-time hygienists. The continuity of care and getting to know the patients is important. It's just an expense that you have to uh, understand that dentist has for part-time uh, for full-time employees. They don't have for part-time. Why do you have to beg for a raise when you've gone up over and beyond? So I'd say, you know, like you saying the words over and beyond, no one really knows what that means. I know what you, you know what it means, but it's just a feeling. So say, Hey, this last year I have produced and collected, I produced an extra $20,000 and we collected an extra $15,000. So while I don't think you should give me $15,000, Dr. Smith, is there a way for me to, capture more of what I've collected. That's a great way to put it and say, and then if you say the dentist won't know what to say. So you say, you know what would make me happy? A thousand dollars. Thank you bonus would make me happy out of that. And if you proved to him, you brought an extra 15,000, you might say uh, yes. Why will they not try new things? Humans don't like to try new things, especially dentists. They're kind of always afraid it's going to go wrong. So maybe encourage them, whether it's a new practice management system, like we talked about here, whether it's a new thing like an allergen alternative. Uh, I like to try new things. I think it's important, but dentists are just not a, a big group that try new things. Why do they say one thing and do another? I could go on and on. Uh, that, that one is a, is a challenging one for all people, and I, I commiserate with you. I don't know if I can fix that in, in a webinar. And we talked about maybe this will set us up for the to be continued. Um, I appreciate everybody who came on here tonight. I really enjoyed doing this. Uh, we will have some recordings available so you can share this with your friends and they can, you know, purchase it for the, um, they may have to purchase it slightly higher than you guys for the $5, but they can listen to it. And then you can submit some ideas to Ariel uh, for another webinar because um, uh, I think, you know, there's just, uh, these things are just making a difference. Podcasts, webinars, hearing stuff, sharing it, maybe share something you learned with your web from the webinar with someone in your office. And when we have this listed for sale, you know, maybe encourage someone to purchase it and say, hey, I'll listen to it. You know, obviously for these prices at $5 and $9 or $8, it's really about doing something that matters. And uh, that's where we're doing this. Bonnie, I like that question. I thought nachos were going to be delivered to each participant uh, and yours didn't arrive. I will, uh, I'll try to make that up next time or, or uh, put your address in. Ar Ariel can uh, get Grubhub to send some to you. But uh, uh, if you come to see courses, I try to have great food. We don't always have nachos because not every place order has nachos available. We're always in Center City, Philadelphia very close to one of the greatest places on earth, El Vez at 13th and Sansom. So you can always go there uh, post CE course and I'm usually willing to join people. So uh, if anyone else has anything else to say, that's uh, 
great. These webinars are a lot of fun. I know I can't you know, hear you or see you guys, but I appreciate your, your uh, adding it to the chats and uh, hope you'll uh, see us for the next one. So that's uh, Paul Goodman and Dr. Nacho. Visit us at dentalnachos.com and any questions, Ariel at dentalnachos.com or Evan at dentalnachos.com. And I'm Paul at dentalnachos.com. So thanks guys and enjoy your Monday night.